Hello, my name is Jack Page. Jack Page. Lathander's light, you're here. Oh my god. Jack, I sold the Copper Cup. I'm part of the Nightstone 4. I don't know what that means. I knew it! <laughs> you know, I was pissed before, but he is going to thunderstep out of here because fuck this guy in particular. 5d6 thunder damage. <laughs> Welcome back to Dice Shame. This is episode 125, Last Night, part one, Jack of All Trades. MVP this week is Nikius, spelled N1C1US, who found the show through Malevolent and is making his way through our back catalog. Thanks for joining us on Discord, Nikius. Welcome to the party, pal. Invictus Con is back for the third year running. Join us, the creators of Dice Shame, Malevolent, and the Invictus Stream, as we hang out on March 25th to 28th for RPGs, panels, video games, social events, an artist alley, and more. It's 100% virtual and 100% free, so there's literally no reason not to attend. We checked. Right now, it's time to sign up to play RPGs. We've been opening registration to the Patreon tiers this week in descending order, and public registration starts this Saturday, March 5th. Join our Discord server for all the details, or check out the website at www.dicechainpodcast.com. Slash InvictusCon. All right, should we get down to business? Let's do it. Torin walks down the stairs and enters the dining room. He's looking very handsome tonight, if somewhat uncomfortable to be here. It's Torin. Lathander's light, you're here. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, I think Jack sort of jumps into his arms from halfway across the room, just like just right over there. Uh-huh. Jumps into his arms. And then oh, Kieran the runs over and jumps into Jack's arms. Yeah, it's, so a, like, it's a whole, yeah. I think we tumble down onto the stairs. It's just a whole pile. Aw. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's so nice to see these reunions. Isn't it, Red? So unreserved of you, Jack. Isn't it, Kraloth? Oh, yeah. And Kraloth had a distant look on his face until Doran reached out to him and he says, Oh, oh, uh, yes, yes, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's Torin, right? Of course yeah, it's I've... Torin, but Yeah, uh, Torin, you, you... Uh. Hi, Torin! <laughs> it's been so long. How you doing? The three of you in a pile. Well, this was awfully nice of you, Red says, turning to uh, Jack's mom. Mm. Yeah, she's like standing with her hands on the back of an armchair regarding all of you. She's like, I saw you on your way here, and I thought I'd bring Torn up to make it three. Of course, your associates are welcome as well. Six is a fine number for today. Not as good as three, but perfectly fine. So kind of you. My goodness, your family is so hospitable, Jack. And Doran kind of tromps into the room, muddy boots and all. <laughs> sits down on the couch, oh, no. muddy feet, Oof. and puts them up on the table, <laughs> on the coffee table. <laughs> yeah, Red sits next to him as well, but like sits on the arm of the couch instead of the actual like cushion of it. Mm-hmm. Swell digs. Yeah, nice fire you got going here. I tell you, it's a little cool outside tonight, isn't it? Yeah. And um, Kraloth, Kraloth kind of looks around, um, just out of curiosity. Are there any Lathander idols? No. Maybe some like weird elven gods, mm. though. But mm. maybe not. This is like... Boris. This is Stelv. <laughs> the elven god Boris. <laughs> Boris. <laughs> a servant woman enters and informs the lady Lelathar that the evening meal is prepared. Mm. And Kimara drifts over to the table and asks everyone to be seated. Ah, swell, oh, some food. food. Yeah. Hey, Doran. Ha. Red mm. nudges Doran and leaps towards and the table. Drink too? Jack grabs Torin's hand and, and leads him over to the table somewhere and uh, takes a seat sort of somewhere down near his mom. And Yeah, Torin like pulls his chair like so that he's sitting about four inches from your left side. Kraloth is... Uh, kind of standing in the corner of the room, looking at a painting, but not really looking at it, almost as if he didn't even hear the announcement of dinner. Crayloft, grab some. Yes. And Red puts both like muddy paws on the table, holding knives and forks, like as if he's like a kid. Oh, oh, yes, yes, uh, dinner. Ah, mmm, (laughs) yum. And Crayloft sits down at the table 
and awkwardly pulls himself in. And I feel like he's like way bigger than this table. Like, yeah. You know, it's really like dainty and beautifully finely carved trim and Kraloff mm-hmm. just pulls himself up to it. Yeah. The staff sets out extra plates and cutlery and things and then starts bringing out food family style. So there's like a large bowl of winter greens, some fragrant clear broth soup, herb flatbreads and some like white fish that smells sort of citrusy and Kimara gestures for you all (laughs) please help yourselves she just leans back in her tall chair and kind of observes you all oh Oh, this looks delicious I can't wait for the main entree yeah and Doran starts diving in with to the fish yeah and red like (laughs) is like creening over the table trying to look for like the main goods Mm -hmm. where's the duck and the turkey hmm Jack slips a piece of the bread to Kieran and sort of sends him a a little mental nudge to maybe go put his head in Kraloth's lap for a minute just to keep him present. Mm. That's Mm. nice. nice. When Kieran's head is placed on Kraloth's lap, Kraloth looks down and he sees Kieran's like big brown eyes looking up at him. And he kind of looks around nervously and just slowly lowers his hand and looks like he's going to pet Kieran, but instead he moves it to the hilt of his mace, and he just holds it there for a moment. And then a big grin fills his face, and he says, Oh, Kieran, oh, what a good doggy. Oh, you're so sweet. Food, yes. Oh, food, oh, my favorite. Oh, are those dumplings? Mmm, I'm going to try those. No, they're not, Kraloth, they're not dumplings. No? It's bread. There's all bread here. There's white fish here oh, it's and just, bread here. It's just regular bread, not filled but with But look, anything. and Dorn grabs a piece of bread and throws it in the, in the broth. And he's like, now you've got dumplings. <laughs> Dorn, 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 it's like Dorn, this overly Dorn, rowdiness. Hey, you're putting your hands right in the soup. Come on, at least wipe them first. Oh, look. Oh, he like I'm takes sorry. a napkin and wipes the mud off of Doran's hand before Doran continues to paw the food. <laughs> you see this like very kind of austere elven woman has portioned herself out this like tiny portion of the clear soup in this little bowl and she's just like holding it and kind of savoring the warmth of it and watching you all messily serve yourselves this (laughs) very elegant um kind of modern type (laughs) elven food oh fuck should we pray (laughs) (laughs) there's a really interesting tension between Torin and Kamara, who have both served this group of people at, at their various establishments, and I'm sure there's Jack just trying to inch a little bit out mm-hmm. of the glares they are giving them each other, knowing looks, their own version of the knowing looks. Were. Mm-hmm. Oh, shit. Sorry, Jack, say something prairie. I don't know. I would, maybe we went to... G- 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 Doran, we're, we're too much on the road. we got to be more civilized. I'd, be yourselves, guys. It's it's okay. Um, mm. Hey, you hear that, Doran? We can really go for it. All right. And Doran reaches over and grabs a bottle of wine that's on, like, the sideboard. And he just, like, it's not even open. He's like, oh, (laughs) all right. And he shoves it in his pocket. (laughs) That's great. The uh, first touch of civilization we've seen in a while, Mom. Uh, So uh, thanks thanks for uh, putting us up. Of course, Eve. It is my pleasure. Why don't you tell me a little about all of you? I would love to get to know some of you better. Well, to... Me and Dawn here, well, so sort of like <laughs> the brains of the group, in so far as, um, well, the way we sort of approach problems. See, Dawn, tell us how you um, did Grudhog and all that. Well, you see, I am an ex-officer from the military. And, you see, when we do things, we like to plan it. And so, um, oh, by the way, this fish, it's delicious. And so is this broth. It's pretty good. Yeah, he's Your got some brains too. Really Don't smart. Your food, jeez. Oh, sorry. No. Yeah, sorry. I've been chewing on this. Mm. Mm. And Kraloth over here. Kraloth. Well, Kraloth is. Well, he's the biggest one of the group, and he's also the holiest one of the group, right? Mm? Doran sort of pats you on the back. You know. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh yes, yes. I, I, I wouldn't want to bore you with all the details of myself. I, I would like to learn about about you. What was it like raising Jack? Oh, um, I mean, uh, and Red tries to kick Kraloth under the table, but he accidentally kicks Doran. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Shit. Lady Laylathar uh, clears her throat delicately. <clears throat> well, you see, uh. 
Mascar actually was Jack's primary caregiver throughout his uh, young life. Oh, caregiver. It was only a couple of years, and, and we spent holidays here all the time. You know, it was uh, mm. just whisked away to Silvery Moon um, into these uh, into this lovely place. I tried my best at all times to give Jack um, an education in the magical arts and to broaden his perspectives, but much of the rearing, I'm afraid, was given over to my, well, to Mascar. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Oh, I would say, yeah, education. Man, he certainly has a lot, a lot of education. <clears throat> You're all welcome to stay here for the night if you like. I'm not sure if you have um, any other plans. Hey, no fooling? Really? We, you don't mind? <laughs> It's Red's new catchphrase. Oh. I feel like for some reason Red has regressed in this episode to like 1920s mixed of like little rascal slang. He's just really no, feeling like he's got to step up in the fancy somehow and that's what fancy felt like to him. He's like, oh yeah, fancy, yeah, like yeah, Waterdeep. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the people I hung out with there. Okay, let me channel that. Oh my that. God, I love that. I love the idea of Red's more fancy talk is like little rascals era like, you got to get you this and no fooling, misters. Yeah. So yeah. cute. No fooling, we can stay here. That sounds wonderful. We're in. Doran and I can take a room. Yeah, yeah. And and are you going to be having a band show up later and, and so we can, you know, ha, have a good time and all that sort of thing? Yeah, we heard there's a party. We're ready to party. Yeah, we're ready to have a good time. Well, seeing as it is already quite late, I, um, I, unfortunately, the revelry will have to wait until another day. Ah, shit. Oh, well. Well, well put it this way. Well, I mean, thank you. Uh... We'll certainly spend the night. Yes, but yeah, but maybe maybe you know, we'll, we'll do something go else maybe. out and find a. Um, I apologize if this is rude, Lady uh, Layla Thar, but uh, I actually, I'm I'm feeling rather. Uh, I would just like to have a, a a room to myself this evening, and I, I, I just I would prefer to stay at just the local inn personally but I, I i i appreciate you i do thank you for your hospitality and the, this this meal is uh and kraloff looks down at his plate and it's barely been touched mm -hmm. and he quickly puts a little carrot into his mouth and says mm, delicious absolutely delicious um i see yes but um i'm i'm certain that we will cross paths again in the morning and um kraloff goes back to the moment that she shook hands with him at the door and that tension that was mm -hmm. there. It's still there bubbling. All of a sudden, even though he's, he's gripping the pummel of his mace, he just, he starts to feel really tense and he says, Oh, I, I actually am. am uh, if you'll excuse me, I am I'm starting to lose my, my appetite a little bit, but, but, uh, I thank you so much for your hospitality. You've been so kind. Red, Doran, Jack, huh? oh. I, I hope you enjoy your stay here. I am going to take my leave, but I will find you in the morning. And Kieran, you too. Oh, yes. Ooh, such a sweet doggy. Oh, yes. And Kraloff pushes his chair back pretty suddenly, and he turns around, and he goes out the back way. Oh, hold on. And Red follows him out of the room. Doran looks at Kraloff's plate at the untouched food, and pulls the plate towards him and dumps it onto his own plate and begins to eat the rest of it. Uh, that was sort of weird. <laughs> Red catches up to Kraloth by the door, maybe. Hey, hold, hold on, buddy, buddy. Mm. What's mm. going on? Uh, You've barely touched your food. You, you haven't been acting like yourself. Uh, well, um, What's going on? And uh, Kraloth, still holding on to the mace, his mace of deception, he he says, oh, Red, 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 it's, it's nothing. It's... It's it's just, it's been a long journey. You know as well as I do that this week has been very trying and I'm just not in the mood to to, to really spend time with new people. I, I could really use some solitude. I, I hope you understand. Yeah, I, I, I guess. It's nothing personal. And Red will roll insight. Contested. Ooh. Contested roll. 24. I got a natural 20. Oh. oh. Which brings me up to 23. Oh, oh shit. shit. He's best he friends. just edged you out. Yeah, oh, yeah. But wow. I That's do deceive very well. Most people I'd be able to fool, but Red, mm -hmm. 
not so much. So you are lying. Oh. So something's off. Oh, 100% something is off. You see, the thing that gives me away, and it's it's just the amount of grip that I have on that mace. It looks like I have it in a death grip. And Like you're ready to fight or? Like I'm clinging to it. Like a lifeline. Like it, it's a lifeline, exactly. So Red studies your face. And in a moment, he knows that you're lying. But he waits. He almost goes to say something and then steps back a half step. All right, then. I hope you have a good night. You too, Red. And Red sort of departs, walking backwards at first and then spins quickly. And by the time he re-enters the room, Doran, he sits back down next to you and he sort of shakes his head and sort of a smile grows on his face again. (sighs) You know what? We don't need him. That's fine. Yeah. It's a party, right? When did the band say oh. they're getting here? Uh, uh, no, Red, I'm sorry. There is no uh, party tonight. Oh. No, no, no party. No party here. But that's why we're going to find a party. Yeah, yeah. There's well, got look, to be some live entertainment in this town. Let's put our shit away. Um, maybe you can show us to our room real quick, and then uh, Doran and I can skedaddle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, l- let me let me show you. I-, I think I know where they're staying. Oh, that was a really, really good dinner. I just want to thank you very much for your hospitality. Red is emptying his water skin into the like empty glass of the table. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate it. And then he takes the bottle of white and starts filling it up like under the <laughs> table a little bit. Anyway, uh, we'll just check out our room, drop our bags, and then be done for the night. And he puts the empty bottle back on the table. <laughs> I wish you a pleasant evening. You too, well, yeah, yeah, just just this way. Um, and as we're walking up the stairs, Jack might sort of turn back over his shoulder and say, uh, y- "You know, it, it may not be your your speed. I, I appreciate that. I, I was hoping to spend some time with Torin tonight. Just to, you know, it's kind of not often someone will teleport them from the other side of the world or something. So, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we were going to check with you first, of course. Of course, but, um, well, that's what we were thinking. Uh, oh, is, well, Jack, why you not spend really time, time with us? But oh, you know what? Oh, oh, we understand. Yeah. It's fine. I mean, it's gosh. okay. Oh. Oh, but that's okay. Yeah, you know what? Don't worry about it. No hard feelings next time. I hope you're still able to have fun without me. Oh, you know oh, so... what we're going to do? With I don't your... know. Oh, um, oh, the things that logical you could go, oh, to personality. So, you know, tough and. Uh, Th- this is your room. Whatever hour of the morning you get back, th- there you yeah, go. I'm gonna go yeah. back to. Hey, well, um, can I ask you one last little favor, maybe, Jack? What's up? Do you uh, mind watching Shale for the evening? Oh, uh, sh- sure. Yeah, okay. As you're asking Jack this, Doran's in the background pushing the beds together in the room. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Um, Thanks, buddy. Shale likes extra crispy snuggles. Where'd you put him? Uh, he's over there somewhere. Bye. Oh, <laughs> he walks out of the room. He's burrowing mm. through something priceless. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and so you're left alone, Jack. It's you and Torin and your mother. You know the meal's finished, and Kimara is just regarding the two of you. I uh, I think Jack's sort of given Kieran that psychic command to like, hey, you're in charge. Go make sure Shale doesn't destroy anything too important. And uh, <laughs> he's sort of got his his chair kind of half half at the table, so he's sort of facing Torin to his right and and his mom across mm-hmm. the table. And and Torin, you can tell he's maybe like a little bit out of place. <laughs> I mean, you guys have probably been here like once together. Yeah, if if that. Yeah. He's like, well, um, well thank you. Uh, so much for dinner. Uh, everything was delicious. And for bringing Torin halfway across Farron. That I just floored. Still, I don't. I still don't know what to say. Of course. Uh, just call it motherly intuition. Yeah, that's. There's a lot of stuff going on, but I, it's nice to have an evening to set some of it aside. I'm glad you made it to my doorstep tonight. As much as I'm sure you are enjoying my company, I should leave the two of you to spend some time together. Time with a loved one is very precious. And she excuses herself. She stands from the table smoothly, Um, sweeps across to your end of the table, and gives you kind of a gentle kiss on the top of your head. See you tomorrow. Rest well, my son. And she glides away. Torin is looking at you with... Uh, hey, hey, 
he like picks his feet up and like crosses his legs awkwardly on the chair and just puts both of his hands on top of your hands across the table. And he's like, this is amazing. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, yeah, I missed you. Torin asks for you to show him your childhood bedroom. I know that you didn't <laughs> like grow up here, but you know that your mother keeps a room for you. Yeah, I think Jack gets into the space and and gets comfortable for a for a bit and uh you know just just spends a quiet moment with with his partner for for a bit you can tell he's got something on his mind that he's turning over and over he says jack i want to talk to you about something of course yeah uh what, what what's on your mind i i think it's a good move i i think this is good news but i'm really worried about what you might think Jack, I sold the copper cup. Oh, interesting. Um, when did that happen? Uh, two weeks ago. Wow. I mean, I, I'm still in the processes of... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I should start from the beginning. I'm still a partial owner. You weren't like pressured or, or nobody like... No. Not like... Because last time we were there, there were people and they were trying to... And that's part of it. So other ruffians, bandits, I don't people looking to extort me have been coming around. They continue to be an issue. And well, your father contacted me and asked if he might help. Oh. I know that you and he have not always seen eye to eye, but I think it's a really good move. Like I said, I'm still a partial owner. And with the extra money that he's able to invest in the business i was able to bump up the protection his notoriety has been very helpful the clientele who's been visiting the copper cup have been i mean i'm seeing politicians uh in the bar it's not just like the normal rabble from down near the docks that's great i'm really sorry that i didn't tell you sooner i mean no that's okay it's it's uh like I mean, it sounds like you're you're still operating the place, or is there any? Changes I was in the of- middle of one of the busiest shifts in the past month when your mom popped up. Believe me, uh-huh. uh, I'm still, you know, elbows deep in the business. I just I knew that you might not approve, and I apologize for that. No, I I mean it. It sucks that. We didn't get to talk about it before it happened, just because it makes this all feel awkward. But far be it from masker wands not to throw money at a problem and try and solve it. And I'm, I, I think it's a great move for you. Uh, I, I certainly like knowing that you're safer and more prosperous. Those are amazing things. The relief is visible on his face. I mean, don't worry. I'm going to be keeping him at arm's length. I'm not going to let him change the place. You know, I don't fully trust him, obviously, with the whole business. This has been in my family for generations, but... Yeah, oh, of course. I don't know. You f- you're you my family, too, so I feel like it still counts, right? Yeah, yeah. It's I- like looking for your approval a little bit. No, it, this is this is a... Uh, this is a good thing. This is This is... This is great. I... You know, like I, I wish I could have been there to to be a part of it. It's, it's a smart thing. I wish I wish I'd come up with it. I I how did you guys end up talking about it? He just came to you. Yeah, he actually showed up in person. Huh. It was very strange. He said that he thought that uh, it would be a good investment for him. I mean, that's that's the most him way of saying he approves of us that I can think of. Right. So I feel like the two of you maybe spend another half hour getting ready for bed, Mm -hmm. sharing kisses and whatever. And then you, you know, kisses and whatever. Um, And then Torin apologizes because he's so tired. No, go to sleep. You find yourself like in bed next to this man who's basically immediately snoring next to you. And there's, there's like a solid... 15 minutes of enjoying hearing his breathing and not fretting about too much else. This is about as peaceful as it's been for him in a while. That's right. 
until a thump from downstairs and Jack gets this picture in his head of, of the uh, Umber Hulk getting under the table and chewing on something and like he's at least out of bed trying to like scoop shale up to try and figure out what kind of attention they need before they can like stop for a minute after half an hour of of chasing shale around jack remembers these pieces of old silverware in his mom's house and they're antique and wonderful but they don't fit in his hands right and he's hated them every time he's had to come here and he's never having another meal with this fork i love that and and shale's hungry and this seems like a perfect opportunity to get one little irritation out of life shale loves it shale eats four or five spoons uh and then emits a strange alien burp (laughs) and then their pupils spin and slowly can see that they're getting sleepy. Jack grabs a tea towel and wraps Shale up in it and Aww. puts him puts him by the fire and uh and then decides to go for a walk outside. I think he's got in the back of his mind that letter from Calliope that we found in the in that ruined cabin. Mm-hmm. And you know, she she was coming to Silvery Moon to beg. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you head out into the late night of Silvery Moon. It's beautiful. Um, you see that there are pieces of architecture shining in the moonlight, and you know them to be made of this kind of moonlight enchantment. Mm-hmm. There's, of course, the the moon bridge, but there are other tall edifices, buildings that are up in the tops of the trees that only are stable uh, at nighttime. And you see there are gatherings of people in the streets, people celebrating the death of this year and the birth of a new one. And... As you're walking down the street, you come to some familiar figures. Excited, quite frankly. I'm excited to tell them that we got on a little adventure. Oh, yeah. This is going to be great. I'm sure they <laughs> had just as good a night. Oh, uh, you Jack! know, I didn't expect it. I don't know why I didn't expect to see you, but uh, hey, what, what are you guys up to? It's a small town. Right, Doran? Uh, That's right. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, um, I was just thinking, you remember that letter from, from the Calliope who... The 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 girl we in the attic. What letter was it? In uh, R. Why don't you hand me the bag of holding? Oh yeah, for- yeah, 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 yeah. And he hands the bag of holding, and you smell red reeks of like <laughs> alcohol, like pure grain alcohol, as if he like bathed in it. He is so smelly uh, and <laughs> blood. You see like blood dripping down some like cut wounds mm. in his arm, as well as Doran. They're both looking rough as hell. Mm. There you go, buddy. Uh, yeah. Are you okay? Never been better. We've been saying yes all night. Ain't that right, Doran? Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. That's, you know, it's it's an option. There's there's other uh, choices one could exercise also. Um, it's all right. We got it covered. Anyway, what do you need? And then he, like, grabs the bag back and reaches in, and he pulls out the letter, and he hands it to you. That's the one, right? Oh, yeah. And it just uh, one second, and Jack reaches back in and finds some of the... the satchels of money that we've got squirreled away and and he pulls some of that out and says, I'm going to go see the baker just to see what's going on around this town. All right, well, how much you taking? Uh, I mean, uh, I'll tell you how much I'm bringing back. Uh... Hey, look, look, Jack makes a little um, illusion of just the three pets curled up by the fire and says, look how warm and comfortable this is. Isn't this, I just had to capture this moment. Oh, well, that's lovely. All right, fine, we trust you. And Red takes the bag back and says, you be good. Don't get any any troubles like Dord and I did. We didn't get into any troubles. No, he did. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> okay. Let's go, Doran, to the moon bridge. Did you know there's a moon bridge? You're supposed to show your butt to it. <laughs> Let's go, Doran. And Red and Doran trot off into the night, <laughs> screaming and singing a song. Where's Kraloth when you need him? In your search for a bakery, you pass by a temple dedicated to the god Ilmater. Yeah, I think Jack sort of cautiously approaches to scope out the place as he's as he's coming to the door to see, if, you know, does it look busy? Does it look like it's having a, a nice, quiet evening? There is no service ongoing, but the braziers inside of the temple are lit with incense, and one or two people are sitting on stone benches inside the body of this temple offering silent prayers to the deity at the front of the church there is a large statue of a a kneeling man whose palms are outstretched tending to this altar there is a priest i'd like to to make an offering if i could 
Of course, my child. Jack reaches into his personal coin pouch and, and puts a, a few, you know, a, tithes a little bit of offering to Ilmater to keep the church, you know, functioning and says, you know, it, it's actually a strange request. I don't know if if um, if you'll be able to help me or not, but I, I'm looking for someone. Her name's Calliope. She, she came to Silvery Moon to try and make her way in the world, but she had nothing when she showed up, or I, I assume she, she must have. I just wanted to sort of make sure she, she ended up all right. It's years later, so the odds of maybe she didn't even stay here or whatever, but... The priest nods sagely at your offering and offers his thanks. As a priest of ill matter, it is my job to catalog the suffering of all who pass through these doors. <laughs> yes, I do recall a young girl of the name Calliope. Amazing. She all right? I recall she gained employment uh, and is residing in service at a manor on the southern side of the city, owned by one Emerus Vether, though I have not seen her since she came through these doors. I hope anyone who comes here never needs to come back because they've found such good support in their life elsewhere, but I'm glad you keep the doors open for everyone who needs it. Providence, I found myself the way here tonight. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on. Blessings on you, my son. And to you as well. So Jack's not necessarily super familiar with all the manor-owning folk in Silvery Moon, but is there a chance he might have heard of Emrys Vether in, in some context? Yeah, you can make a uh, history check. I'd love to. How do you like a 24? I like a 24 just fine. Me too. You recall your mother maybe um, years ago mentioning something about Vether shipping, um, that this is a man who is um, well-to-do in the city, certainly, and that you figure if you made your way to the neighborhood, you could probably parse out which residence is his. Yeah, for for lack of a better thing to do. And I, I think having having got his feet in Silvery Moon, he's starting to to see a, a side of the city that that is now like confronting on his own level, right? Like nobody's brought him to this part of the city. It's a thing he's going about on his own. So, you know, let's let's see how the Vethers celebrate the holidays and, and walk over to, to that manor house. Mm-hmm. After a little bit of wandering, a lovely um, light snowfall beginning to just dust the streets here and there. And you see candles in windows as you pass through the neighborhoods. You find your way to a manor house, a lovely two-story home with statues flanking the double doors at the front. Mm. Ivy trains down the walls and pours over the windows, lit from within by golden light. There's a plaque on the front gate that reads Vether. It would seem that the occupants are at home. Yeah. He decides to uh, proceed up to the door. All right. You knock on the door, and in short order, it opens to reveal an elderly man, a human, stooped and wearing gray servant clothes. <clears throat> Good evening. Hello. Uh, my name is... Jack Page. Um, I'm told there's a, a, a woman who works here. I, I'm hoping to have a word with her. Calliope was, was her name. She, she maybe came into town five years ago or so. Who are you? Jack Page from the House of Wands in Waterdeep. Um, archaeologist and wizard by trade. And what want have you of a servant girl? I have some news about her family, and I just wanted to make sure... Um, I just wanted to speak with her. I'll see if the master is willing to entertain company. Come come in, come in. Oh, thank you. And he opens the door to permit you. The entryway of this mansion is warm and smells of wood smoke. The furniture around you is plush and inviting, with chairs and couches arranged for conversation. You're led into this sitting room. On the west wall, there is a large painting of a forest, and the fireplace crackles merrily beside you. Above the mantel, there is a painting of a noble-looking half-elf, and you are left in this room to wait as this servant retrieves his master for you. After a few minutes, the servant returns with a man. 
This is a half-elf man, immaculately groomed, with silver hair that is quite closely cropped to his head. Mm-hmm. He's in like a silk dinner jacket kind of vibe, and he's carrying a pipe in his hand, and he gestures with the stem of the pipe. Hmm. Jack Page. Uh, hi, I, I appreciate you, you meeting with me, my lord. It's, uh, you know, I, I understand it's a holiday. I wouldn't be intruding if I thought I'd be in town long, but... Not at all, not at all. Just enjoying some things for dinner before I head out myself. It's interesting that you come calling. Um, Garion tells me that you're inquiring about a young servant of mine, Calliope? That's right. Um, it's quite a storied tale, but I ran across her, her family's home. It had suffered quite a tragedy a couple of years ago, and we'd found some, some documents that were left behind, and just in general, a, a little bit of, maybe could offer a little bit of closure. I just wanted to see if, if she was around and doing all right. Ah, uh, yes. I mean, she is, of course, around, this being my household and her place of residence. However, she is currently at her duties, and I don't wish to disturb her. I appreciate I didn't make an appointment, and I'm sure you're in the middle of everything. You don't think she'd be available for five minutes just to have a a brief conversation? How to put it? Calliope came from a traumatic past, and surely I don't wish to trouble her any further than she already is. Fair. I, I'm not looking to, to drag up anything that she wouldn't want brought up either, but hopefully she could at least know that she had the option to to just know what Certainly. was... Certainly. Well, perhaps you can impart your wisdom to me, and then I can pass it along to her as I deem necessary. You can't just invite her into the room for a couple of minutes? Perhaps you are from a household that is not familiar with the roles of servants, I will do with the help of my home as I see fit. Fair. It, is she is she indentured? Mr. Page, when Calliope came to me, it was not in the typical manner that one is generally used to uh, acquire servants. She was in my home in the middle of the night, going through my possessions, and I offered her the option of going to jail for the crime she was committing against my household or foregoing any legal issues and working here to pay off her debt, shall we say. And she very wisely chose the latter. Understood. You, you seem very magnanimous as an individual, f- for sure. Is her remaining debt a particularly great value? It, it's been five years. I, I Perhaps I could help set, settle up and, and make sure that you have been none the worse for wear. For, for all the trouble you've been put through. That's a very generous offer for a man who seems to have such little stakes in the life of this young woman. What would you propose? I mean, is there a dollar value you have in mind? Make an offer, Jack. hundred gold pieces. Oh, come now. You could hire a servant for more than the time she's ever spent in your house. I'm not sure I understand why that feels so ridiculous. I appreciate your generosity, Jack, but it is not so easily ended. I actually have uh, some plans for the evening, so if if that is all, if you don't mind, uh, I will depart, actually. I'm on my way to a, um, a fete, as it were. Tis the season. Uh, I enjoy the rest of your evening. And you as well. The servant leads the both of you out. He watches. Emerus puts on his outdoor shoes and sets off into the night as Garrus nods at you and closes the front door. Just in, in the moment between when the Lord has ridden off and Garrus closing the door, Jack would just like to, to sort of turn to him and be like, that was a weird encounter, wasn't it? My lord is, is very generous in not having sent young Calliope to see what the jails look like from the inside, as it were. <laughs> you sure there, there isn't some offer I could, I could make you where I could speak with her for five minutes? Mr. Page, you wouldn't want to have a servant like Calliope. She is an ignorant girl and lazy, so... But, I, but I'm just saying, you yourself could find your, with five and a half years of wages in your pocket... He looks down the street at the back of his master. As he turns the corner, Garrus says, As long as there's no evidence that I've permitted you 
to enter this house without my master's express bidding. Understood. You you definitely haven't done that. But if there was another door somewhere that was unlocked or something, you couldn't have prevented some crazy adventurer from intruding the way Calliope had a number of years ago. He holds his wrinkled hand out through the door that's still open about four inches. And into it, Jack pulls a pouch out. Just gives all the money Red's been saving. Just every gold, every solitary gold coin. You know what? It's just fucking money, man. I, look, <laughs> it's, it's not like you can't wire dad for more money. He's got tavern buying money these days. He's we, got tavern buying money. Right. Garrus thoughtfully hefts the coin purse in his hand, sort of testing the weight of it. And then he says, side door through the kitchen. And then he closes and locks the front door. Mm -hmm. Jack will make his way around the side door. Are there a lot of footprints in the snow on the property? Or does it look like there's some pretty well-shoveled paths and that's it? There is a well-trod servant's path that would lead from the kitchen door around the side to kind of a back alley area. I I guess I'm I'm thinking, is Jack going to leave footprints walking around to the side door if he goes right from the front door to the side door? Yes. Yeah, so he may need to go out to the street and walk down the block and circle around just to not, you know. Devious. Well, he's he's read enough crime novels in his time. Has he, though? They're Torrin's favorite. (laughs) <laughs> he, he's he's tried to he's tried to relate. Look, the you know the 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 masked villain of Waterdeep is one of the favorite series of Torrens. Oh, I like that. I can imagine you guys like reading passages to each other, sitting underneath a tree somewhere in Waterdeep twenty years ago. Yeah. So you cleverly make your way around to the side of this manor. Right. And you find a single wooden door. Like the masked thief of Waterdeep. Yes. I love that in your head, you're like kind of putting yourself into this storybook now. Like like if he was picturing himself now, he definitely like without subconsciously is picturing Red dressed in the like domino mask of the masked thief of Waterdeep who would sneak up to the back of a house. And he's just trying to like do what, do what feels naturally there. Mm-hmm. I love it. You open the door... And you find yourself in a bright, clean kitchen, two windows looking out into the moonlit yard. Mm -hmm. And Garrus is standing there in the doorway to the kitchen. He's cleaning a large iron pot. Mm -hmm. And he gives you kind of a suspicious look and then turns back to his business as if he doesn't see you. So trying to stick to more of the servanty spaces, Jack heads to the north. You find yourself in a room dimly lit by a golden candelabra that rests atop a rectangular dining table. There's a single silver place setting at the head of it. So you have another door leading east. It would seem that both of these doors that you had previously neglected probably lead into the same large room. All right, so he'll, he will head into that larger room, yeah. You find yourself in a large hallway where there are two tall suits of armor overlooking four different doorways, one that looks like it could lead to a library. When we were in the Hamperet household, we'd Mm -hmm. seen some funky suits of armor. um, And there's just a moment of like memories back to a a haunted manor full of awful people that uh, sort of flash in front of Jack's face as he sizes up this armor, just trying to like gut check, are you full of awful magic that's about to murder me? Hmm. Mm. Roll a gut check? I gut, don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible for you to know if these uh, suits of armor will eventually murder you. I guess we'll start at door number one on the left and, and just sort of peek through to see if we can find signs of people. The furnishings and ornate decorations make it clear that this is Amaris Vethar's bedroom. Hmm. A large four-poster bed draped in blue velvet occupies the middle of this room. Next to it is a dark wooden wardrobe and a bedside table with a leather-bound journal sitting next to a vase of freshly cut flowers. Is he single? Like, it looks like he's, this is his room alone? That's right. Okay. Uh, the journal might be the place to start. Yeah. In the journal, you find that he has written over the past few days about manifest logs from a ship transporting stolen goods from Everland. Supplies meant for a bakery. Aha. Well, that's interesting on a number of levels. That feels personal. You know, I was pissed before, but I take that journal and I head to the library. 
Large wooden doors open to reveal a cozy library lit by warm candlelight. Two walls of shelves stretch to the ceiling with a rolling ladder to help reach the higher books. In the center of the room is an armchair and desk. Books are piled haphazardly on the desk, many of them left open next to a bottle of ink and a quill. An imposing stone statue stands in the corner next to the door, silently watching. The idea of this giant stone presence while you're trying to like read comfortably and learn a thing is really screwing them up. Mm -hmm. Like it's put in a strangely central place in a room that that isn't necessarily for displaying statues. It just something is catching his imagination about it. And this statue belongs in a museum. (laughs) Um, I think he might read some of the titles of the books that are on the table just to see if there's anything that jumps out as Um, particularly interesting or nefarious. If you spend some time looking at the open books on the desk here, you can see that the person who had left them open was reading about gnolls. Yeah, I'm going to open the next door and and shut that one uh, quietly. The bedroom contains a small single bed, an old, dusty wardrobe, and a girl kneeling by her bed. Uh, Hi. She is startled by your entry, and her eyes go wide. She stands up, and she climbs up on her bed. Are you Calliope? Yes. Are you okay? I'm sorry. Did I I do something wrong? No, 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 no. Nothing wrong. Um, I can't imagine what you've been through. I, I, uh, um... I was at your house. I found the note you left. Um, what? In the in the forest. Some friends of mine were, were trying to take shelter, and we we stumbled into your the house you grew up in. And uh, what went what happened there? It sounds awful. I can't imagine what you're going through. But I I know you were coming to Silvery Moon, hoping for for something better. And I just tears are welling in her eyes and just pouring down her face. She's like, "Is this a joke?" Jack pulls out the note that she'd left and and sort of puts it somewhere in between them and, and backs away to sort of not, you know, make it as, as maybe like on the edge of the bed if she's crawled up into the far side of it, somewhere that she can reach, but it's not too threatening that he's getting close or anything. Yeah, she crawls towards it and picks it up immediately. Oh my God, who are you? My name's Jack Page. I'm part of the Nightstone Four. I don't know what that means. I gotta tell you, this place has been giving me the creeps the whole time I got here. The the Lord of the House, Lord Vether, he had some interesting ideas of indentured whatever the hell. And and I, if that's how you're comfortable living, you're certainly welcome to. But you know, if if you'd like to try something different, maybe there's a way I could help. I I don't know what that even would look like or mean yet. But are you saying that you've come to take me away? If you want to leave, yeah, I would, I would love to leave, but I can't. Why not? I can't leave. I've never been able to cross the front door. What's it feel like when you try? Like fire all over my body. I'd like to detect magic. Would that be okay? Yeah, but what does that mean? Uh, It would mean I'd be able to see anything that was magical in this room, just to get a sense of what what auras and spells were at work here. It might give us an idea of why you couldn't cross the threshold. He he will not let me leave. We'll, We'll cross that bridge when we get here. Let's figure out why you can't leave first, and once that's solved, we can figure out you get to decide what you want to do. Jack is going to say the words and move his fingers in the required way and detect magic within 30 feet. Mm. So there's quite a bit of magic aura coming from the library. Mm-hmm. But the whole room that she's sitting in, there's like a fog of right. evocation magic. Um, what What is it? What, did you, what do you see? There is a, a mist of of evocation magic around us. I'm just trying to... Okay. I'm going to head to the library. In the library, there's an aura of magic surrounding a small inscribed rune on top of the doorframe. It is lavender in color and pulses the same evocation magic. Can I can I investigate this rune to see if there's any sense of what that pulsating power is doing or a way to disable it if it's... Definitely. Yeah, roll arcana. Would love to. 16. This is certainly related to the emanation of magic that is permeating the rest of the manor. Mm -hmm. You would presume that this specific rune controls a specific area of effect. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, 
you can't figure out what it does or how to disrupt it. I have some ideas. You also detect that the statue is no ordinary statue, but has a, an aura of transmutation around it. I knew it! <laughs> um, I'd like you to stand in the door of your bedroom. I, I have a plan. She goes over and she stands there fretting. Most magical sigils need to be written on something, and so if the thing that they're written on isn't there anymore, it's, it's pretty disruptive. Sounds like a good bet to me. His plan is just to, to firebolt the, the door frame and then see what happens. I love it. Okay, your firebolt catches this rune on the door frame with magical fire energy. And as the crackling fire takes over these magical etchings, the aura of evocation magic that you had been perceiving flickers like a candlelight and then fades in this room. And as you acknowledge the success of this plan, the stone golem beside you begins to move. Roll for initiative. Uh, 12. Marvelous. Don't move. It's going to be okay. I think this is working. Calliope lets out a little scream. Uh, If you have anything you want to take with you, grab it quick. She rolled five for her initiative. And the stone golem rolled a 10. So it's your turn, Jack. What do you do? Move towards Calliope. The golem charges you as you just escape its grasp. It reaches out a long, stony hand towards you and tries to slam you. Ooh, that'll do it. That's 26 to hit. Uh, That does hit. That is 18 bludgeoning damage. Ow. And a second slam attack against you. That's 25 to hit. 14 bludgeoning damage. Uh, 18 and 14? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Calliope runs out of her bedroom. She has a small package with five worldly possessions in them. Can I see a window from where I am? Is there a... Yep, there's one out in the hallway, sort of between the two suits of armor. Jack is having taken these two like fearsome blows. He's a little bit bloody. His his lips are swelling. His his back is sore, but he's kind of undeterred as he reaches out to Calliope and grabs her hand. And as an extra fuck you, he was just going to misty step out of here without a problem. But instead, he is going to thunder step out of here because fuck this guy in particular. <laughs> um, and so seeing Great. the moon bridge glowing in the distance, he teleports out of this room with Calliope in hand, leave an explosion in his wake to land on top of the moon bridge. She's in your arms, curled against your chest with her eyes screwed tight, not even daring to open them. You've been through so much, Calliope. Your life's going to change from now. I'm going to try and help. No more servitude. She looks up at you in relief and then amazement just opens her eyes and she looks out and around at the night sky. For the first time in five years, she's free. Let's find somewhere safe to go. Jack starts wandering back towards his mom's house and remembers the Temple of Ilmater on the on the way there and stops inside. <laughs> Man, he looks like shit, though. He's been beat up real good. Yeah, he has been. Uh, <laughs> you look much different than you did an hour ago. I didn't mean to take Ilmater's pugilism in, in such a literal fashion this evening, uh, Father, but I'm, I'm hoping you could help. I always can. Uh, Calliope, yes? There's a, a bakery in Everland that's always looking for help. Um, I'd love to, to leave some money if you could arrange travel for Calliope down in that direction, if that's a place you'd like to go. You don't have to stay there, but it's far enough away from here, you might be able to figure out what to do next. Yes, that, that sounds, that's perfect. I, I don't want to stay here. I Thank you so much. I I don't even know why. Just thank you. Next time I'm in Everland, I'll, maybe we can have a have a coffee and and I can tell you about what happened at your family's place, and you can tell me about the new life you've found. She throws herself into your arms and gives you a really tight squeeze, and then uh, scrubs her face and looks up at the priest who nods sagely and leads her back towards the the cloister where there are some dormitories and she turns around and gives you a wave before they both duck out of sight i wonder where kraloth was staying jack kind of thinks as he's wandering around trying to figure out how he's going to not be beat up when he goes to crawl in bed with his boyfriend and as you think about kraloth not for the first time in the past hour you realize that the platinum ring of warding that you wear 
on your right hand has grown very, very cold. <laughs> Thank you once again to our wonderful Patreon supporters, Christopher Ryan Evans, Merlin, Mitchell Cadwell, Alex Reed, Michael and Brianna Weber, Colin Burkhart, Daniel, Doug, Gray, Jackie and Rain, Jessica Orrit, Jonah Goldman, Melanie Shian, Lars, and Mari Kaniski. See you soon! <laughs> <laughs>